morning, everyone. I am so glad to be here and very pleased that all of you people got up at the crack of dawn to be here and share this very, very special prayer breakfast. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge my favorite teacher, sage, and friend, Rabbi Joel Schwab, who although he has officially retired, will always be my rabbi. For Jews, prayer is both communal and personal, and the basis of prayer and learning is the Torah. In the narrowest sense, the Torah refers to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Torah is divided into 54 portions which are read weekly in the synagogue. Each passage is called a Parsha, and the Parsha that is being read this week is the Parsha about Noah. Similar to a homily is a Devar Torah, in which one speaks about topics relating to the section of the Torah <clears throat> and which usually contains a life lesson which is related to passages from the Parsha or weekly portion. So, since the Parsha for this week is Noah or Noah, and since a Devar Torah is a way a Jew would approach a gathering such as a prayer breakfast, I'd like to give you a brief Devar Torah on a part of the reading. There are many parts to this Parsha. The building of the ark, the flood, the rainbow, and the famous story of the Tower of Babel, which gives the biblical explanation for the multiplicity of languages in the world. I know that you all recall that after the flood, the world repeopled and those people decided they would build a tower to reach to heaven. And the people said, come, let us build a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make ourselves a name, lest we be scattered upon the face of the entire earth. At that time, everyone spoke one language, and they wanted to build the tower so that they could be together, kind of like a home base. But you know the expression, man plans and God laughs. <laughs> well, apparently the tower was not part of God's plan. God didn't want everyone to be together, nor even to be speaking the same language. Seems like God decided that diversity was paramount, and he wanted different people to view the world differently. And as the Parsha goes, when God saw the tower, he confused the language of the entire earth and scattered the people upon the face of the entire earth. Why might God want us to be different from each other? Perhaps it was so different people could find different pathways to God, all of which would be meaningful and uplifting. Perhaps it was so different people could develop different manners of understanding the world that we all live in. Perhaps it was so different people could share their different approaches with each other, thereby enriching all people and enriching that commonality, human culture. Most importantly, perhaps it was so that different people could ultimately understand that being different is not bad. Should we now look for the unity that we lost back at the Tower of Babel? If we don't, we may be doomed, but maybe we can learn and now understand that unity must come along with diversity and not at its expense. Perhaps that what, that's what the Torah told us when God changed our languages from one to many and sent us out all over the earth. So let me end with this thought. If that's what God wants, then the best thing we can do is to come together in unity and come together to celebrate our differences. Thank you. Thank you, Carla Wise. Our next speaker is a very special young man, uh, Manny Martinez III. He's a Goshen High School senior Manny is one of 13 children whose father is a pastor and at his grandfather's church in the Bronx. 
Manny currently attends Goshen Christian Reformed Church, and one of the couples on our committee met him on a bus trip to Albany where they were heading to pray for the New York State. Now, how cool is that? <coughs> they saw such maturity and passion for the Lord in Manny, and they were grateful that he was willing to let some of that passion spill out on the rest of us this morning. So please welcome Manny, who will speak about prayer in his life. Manny. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, a, few year, a few years ago, I would not see myself in um, a big crowd like this or in front of a group at all. Um, I've been running from God for a long time. I was, you know, my dad's a pastor, but I grew up to dislike God and didn't grow up in growing with my faith as being a Christian my whole life. I never was uh, committed, but to start off with um, a verse from Philippians chapter four, verse six through seven. Uh, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guide your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Now, if I would have seen this verse back in, I'd say my middle school years, maybe a little bit back, I would have disagreed. I didn't, again, um, I would go to church services after services Sunday um, and not care about what's going on, not paying attention, um, what God wanted to tell me or speak to me. And um, for the longest time, I've been uh, distracted. And um, I went to, through a change in my life where I was lost. I didn't, I further would say I went, my life went from dark to light. So going back, um, being around my cousins and friends in church and people, God knew I had a lot of distractions and um, I wanted, in my life I didn't, I didn't say it, but I, I, I wanted to know God in some aspect, but he knew I, again, I had distractions. So what God did was little by little, he started to take dist- um, distractions away. My cousins had to move um, further away from uh, the city and my friends. So I was, um, left kind of alone in church and thinking like, you know, God, what's going on, you know, no one's here, you know, I'm losing it. And um, I just um, didn't know what to do at the time. And um, I started to go more to church and just trying to figure out, like, God, what do you want me to do? And I said, you know, I, because God knew, again, that I had distractions, he came to me um, one night, one sermon. Um, I just, like, went outside and just um, started to say, you know, God, why are you doing this? Why do you hate me? My life just kind of changed around. You know, as a little kid, you think that, you know, you you're young and you can do whatever you want and life is good and until it hits the moment where you know things start to fall apart again my f- friends and cousins started to move I lost faith I'm like you know what, what am I doing wrong I'm just a kid and um, I said God I, I need a sign to see you I need a sign to believe that you're there you know I, I don't really see it you know I've been in this um, life for, for a long time and um, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior, but it didn't end there. Sometimes when we accept God into our heart, Jesus into our heart, we think that things will just start to get better and there's no bad and nothing that can get in the way and um, that there won't be temptation or trials that you have to go through. And I just didn't get it. And I said, you know, God, I accepted you and look at this. And I expected him to do all the work, but I, I didn't do my part. 
So I went further and deeper into a darkness, running again away from God. And, you know, right when, at that moment, if I would have stayed longer and said and thought about it, I could have, um, I could have seen uh, God and, and stuck with scripture and put it into practice, but I didn't. I ran away again. And in school, school is one of the, um, the hardest things for me because I'm not always that good in school but or inf um, had a good influence of friends and um, I went into a, a moment of um, a time of hopelessness, careless, isolation, depression. Um, I just didn't care about life anymore, didn't care about God. You know what? You're not helping me. I don't think you're there. You know, problems keep arising. Um, my friends don't care about me. I just didn't feel like I fit in in school anymore. And didn't feel like I belong. Everyone was in a different world talking about um, things that, you know, a, a normal teenager would talk about, and my mind was different. I, I, I grew up in a, in, in a different um, place. I, uh, um, I just felt I didn't belong. And sadly to say, I st started to go deeper and running and then I fell into a hole where I felt like I couldn't get out of. And that led to um, starting drugs, but God stopped that right in the start. And then it led to drinking and that kept going for a while, but God stopped that. And it could have gone beyond that, but God came, you know, I start, again, I started to say, you know what, I have nothing to lose. You know, it's gotten to the point where God knew that, you know, he didn't give up on me. And I started to go to more to church until, you know, the preacher and through the word of God, he spoke to me and it impacted my life. And I started to go and I started to pray more. I started to read the gospel and, and, st and st started talking to God. And things started to change. But God doesn't start... God, you know, change comes from self, but God transform, transforms our life. And, you know, while I took the next step to change, to, to step and say, you know, I, I want, you know, to praise you, Lord God, just, I had to surrender to him completely in one of the services and just raise my arms to God because sometimes we need to let go of everything and just raise and, and, and just praise God and, and say, you know, God, I'm going to praise you through, through what I'm going right now. Because, you know, I'm not going to give up. And I, I want to praise you. I want to look for you. I need you. And things started to change from there. I started to feel the Holy Spirit. I started to feel something that I never thought I could feel again. And I said, God, I want, I want uh, more of this. I want, you know, to be, I, I want more opportunities that I can do this. And God, later on, you know, in the year, my parents and family went to an uh, Easter extravagance in Goshen, uh, where we lived for 10 years. And the, they went over there and they told me about a Goshen uh, Christian church over there. And for some reason, we didn't go to church that Sunday morning in my grandfather's church in the city. And God just kind of put it in my mind to walk over there. And as I walked over there to the church, the pastor talked about growing roots in the church, growing roots um, and, and, and um, really congregating and getting to know people and, and, and being what we were called to be a body of Christ and God being the head. And it was just, it was so real. And, and God speaking to me, this is where I want you to start. Uh, and not even from that day on that, that I started, uh, that, that God started working in my life because the whole time God has always worked in my life, but I started to, my eyes were open that I started to see God everywhere I went. Everything that God did, everything that happened in my life, being a part of this congregation, and not only um, I was able to uh, be a part of their youth group and getting other programs that they had, um, cadets uh, counseling, and um, a mission trip that they had to go to Haiti, and um, it didn't end there with a, a youth group. It, there was other um, things that um, I was able to get, um, get in, but there's just so much I can go into, but my life just changed from that moment on, God sightings and everything. Yeah. And um, 
I have another verse here, Thessalonians 1, chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, where it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is, what God, this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. So going back to Philippians 4, 6, 7, 6 through 7, where it talks about, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let you, um, um, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guide your hearts in Christ. It was then putting those uh, two um, verses together that, you know, I had that peace of God in me. I had that comfort that in all circumstances and, and rejoicing in God that through anything that happens, I can give thanks to God. You know, I don't, uh, the comfort of the Holy Spirit is in me and going through any problem, whether um, another t uh, test or temptation comes my way, I'm not the same person I used to be. Amen. And um, I just, you know, could go on, but thank you so much for this time. Thank you for coming and thank you for letting me be here. Craig Stephen Brown is an Orange County native. Both he and his wife graduated from Pine Bush High School and now live in Orange County where they raised their four children. Judge Brown graduated from SUNY Buffalo School of Law and went on to work in New York City as an assistant district attorney in Queens and Orange Counties. He was a partner at Larkin and Gracia and Brown in Newburgh before being elected a county court judge here in Orange County where he currently serves. Please welcome Judge Brown as he shares with us a reading from the New Testament. Judge Brown. Good morning, everyone. First, I just want to take a moment, give another round of applause to Manny, an 18-year-old boy who came up, opened himself up to 400 people in this room. The courage it takes for that is incredible. I also want to thank Dot for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. And I have to tell you, when she initially approached me, I thought to myself, sure, no problem, right? And then I started looking at what I was going to choose to read and what I was going to choose to speak about. And when you first start getting into it, it's a little more challenging than you initially thought it was going to be. And this is a leadership breakfast, so I tended to concentrate on two specific concepts. Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary of doing good. For proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up, as well as Philippians 2 through 4. Each of you should not look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. These concepts of patience and persistence of service to others and not giving up are things that we as leaders need to keep in mind always. Leaders often are ambitious. By, very, by their very nature. They're confident people. And we all are human. And we always have to be cognizant of the danger that our ambition poses to us. As leaders, we need to set aside our ambitions sometimes in order to make sure that we recognize, appreciate, and are always cognizant of the fact that we are serving the citizens and the people in our community who have entrusted us to the positions we find ourselves in. We work to serve our communities. And again, our ambition, sometimes our selfish ambition, can pollute even the purest of intentions. And we see that day in and day out. Everyone starts off with good intentions. And we have to be cognizant of the fact that our ambitions sometimes can cause problems with those ambition, with the, uh, the ability to make sure that we do the right thing. Our ambitions have driven us to serve others, to do right, and we must never lose sight of what is right and what is just. That's why it's so important that we get together like we do today and we surround ourselves with people who are not afraid to remind us of our intentions and of our pure intentions. We don't want to get off track and surrounding ourselves by people who will continue to remind us 
will only help us make sure that we do the right thing moving forward. Because it's not only important to do the right thing, but it's important to do the right thing the right way. Even when things are not progressing the way that we believe they should, we can't get frustrated and take shortcuts. We have to make sure, again, we do the right thing the right way. And I encourage our county executive and the, the committee that puts this together to continue this tradition each year so that we can get together, not to beat our chests, not to pat each other on the backs, but to remind each other why we are in the positions we are in and to be grateful for that opportunity that it provides us to help our communities and to make our communities better. The ends do not justify the means if the means undermine the integrity of our leaders. We've been given throughout our lives this concept that our word is our bond. And we've given our word that we will live a life of service as leaders. That's the promise that's inherent in our acceptance of leadership roles. We have to make sure we remember that and we embrace it. Our faith is our foundation of these principles. And I wanna uh, just God bless each of you for coming here today, for giving your time and attention to the leaders in our community and for reminding them, me, and us of the right way to do things. God bless you and God bless Orange County. Good word, good word from the judge. Everybody, uh, uh, make sure you shake his hand on the way out, <laughs> you know? I met him last night, I'm like, oh, judge, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, Judge. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Our next speaker is Leslie Haskin. And Leslie is the youngest of 15 children. She was born to a Baptist minister. Leslie grew up in Chicago's notorious South Side, but was surrounded by a healthy family life. She came to New York City where she quickly climbed in the corporate ladder working at B-Trade, Michael Bloomberg's company in the North Tower of World Trade Center. Leslie's life changed drastically on 9-11 when she lost, not only lost 22 friends, but developed PTSD and lost everything she had, including her home, after much struggle and as an overcomer. Today, Leslie is a New York Times best-selling author an international keynote speaker, and most recently founded Life Station Center of Excellence. Clearly, she is putting her hands to the work that God has purposed for her. Let us greet Leslie now as she prays for our county leaders. Leslie. Will you bow your heads with me and open your hearts? I would ask that each of you would bring to the surface of your heart those concerns that you most have for our community and for our nation as we approach the throne of God. Master, you told us in your word that perilous times would come, and indeed they have come. We are watching our schools in free fall, and prayer has become a dirty word. We are watching our children use guns as the go-to to resolve simple disputes. We're watching our parents lose their courage and their faith in wondering how to hold on for that next thing that's around the corner. But Lord, you have prepared us. You have gone before us and you have appointed a leadership to lead us through these dark times. And so we pray today for that leadership that they would go forward and penetrate the darkness of these times. Lord, not to change things, but to bring through the darkness those who would see your light. Give us the courage to stand against all odds. Give us the convictions to stand against all voices and opposition. Give us, Lord, the integrity 
to do your word and your will and not our own. Lord, will you cause the one and only agenda that we follow to be your agenda, that we would bring with us a harvest for you and for your glory. Lord, I ask that you would send your Holy Spirit throughout this room and test the hearts of each individual and know that we tell you the truth when we say we are in pain. We are mourning the loss of our loved ones and our society and our community and the world as you intended for it to be. And so, Father, we, we come to you not knowing another place to go, knowing that you are the one place that we come. And so we are here, and we are forward-facing and focused on you alone, knowing that your word is true, knowing that you are true, knowing that in the end of it all, there will be an amazing celebration of overcoming. When we meet with you in that one heavenly place, give us the strength, the courage, the integrity, the love that we would give that light and that hope to our community as we serve them in serving you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You're gonna publish that right, and put it in the newspaper. That was fantastic. You should. Our keynote speaker this morning is Major Retired Scotty Smiley. Scotty is West Point graduate. He's a Ranger and Combat Diver Qualified Infantryman. He was serving in Iraq on April 6, 2005. That day, a suicide car bomber blew himself up and Scotty was blinded. He went on to receive the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart, and most importantly, embarked on a journey of faith with his wife, Tiffany, who has joined us today. Scotty, despite his blindness, went on to become the first blind active duty officer and also realized other incredible accomplishments, including surfing, climbing Mount Rainier, skydiving, earning an MBA from Duke University, teaching leadership at West Point, winning an SB and the MacArthur Leadership Awards, and becoming a father. Today, Scotty is an author, speaker, adventurer, retired veteran, husband and father of three, living in Washington State. We are so very proud and honored to have you, Scotty, with us this morning. Please welcome Major Scotty Smiley. Thank you so much. I'm humbled and honored to be uh, here, especially in Orange County, among so many amazing leaders. It's just, um, I, I just am shocked that this is the second prayer breakfast in Orange County. Um, it's mind boggling, but I encourage you all to continue these as, and just worship the Lord and pray for the leaders in the community. Um, I, you know, today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Something I tell my little boys every morning, no matter if I'm having to wake them up or uh, they're waking me up, but it's a beautiful day. I'd like to uh, uh, go back in history a little bit. Uh, when I woke up at 2.45 one morning, not a normal time I woke up, wake up, but this morning I was gonna do a triathlon. So I had to load my bike into the truck, drive about 45 minutes away to Northern Idaho, Coeur d'Alene, sign in, place my bike, get riding on my arms, on my calves, my age, and then made it just in time to hear the cannon go off as we began to enter the water. After 1.2 miles down, a little bit of a swim, got out of the water, went through the timer, got right back in because I was only halfway done. I had another 1.2 to go. You see, I was gonna do an Ironman this day. And as the temperature began to rise, finishing the swim, hopped on my bicycle, began to pedal my little life away. 56 miles down, halfway done, so we were getting tired already. <laughs> I was exhausted. The temperature just began to soar, reaching up around 105 degrees that day. Finishing the bicycle ride, 112 miles down, 2.4 mile swim, 
All I had was a little jog to go, 26.2 miles. <laughs> and just about the time I reached the three mile mark, my temperature just began to soar. I couldn't no longer see the finish line in sight, though I was well into the race. My vision, my attitude didn't have a keep it going. It was failure. I couldn't do it. Well, I want to rewind several years earlier, say I was blessed to be raised in a Christian family in Washington State. Making a decision on gra upon graduating, I knew I wanted to become a leader. So I chose to attend the United States Military Academy here in West Point, New York. And I, I knew it was the right decision, but I was on, as I think, the only one-way flight that has ever been purchased for me. I was a basket of tears, leaving my mom and dad, my brothers and sisters, and of course, my high school girlfriend. We know how important those are. <laughs> but I knew it was the right decision. As I landed in Newark, New Jersey, rushed on a bus up to New West Point, they quickly shaved my head, my beautiful locks, I don't know why, <laughs> they needed them. Put me in a gray shirt, black shorts up to my, halfway up my thighs, black socks up to my knees, black leather loafers. Some of you imagine what I look like? Yes, <laughs> a dork, I know. But you see, they were breaking us down to our most simplistic form to raise us back up, to teach us the Army values, teach us that a cadet will not lie, cheat, or steal, nor tolerate those who do. It was amazing, but the stresses in my life just continued to soar. Waking up early, delivering newspaper, memorizing the newspaper, calling minutes, delivering laundry, stresses just continued. And I remember moving out down the hallway, 120 paces per minute. That's quite a bit of steps, not running. You know, I'm, granted, I'm this 210 pound, twisted steel, sex appeal kind of guy. Like, <laughs> I, I'm a stud, at least my own mind. <laughs> this female, about a foot short of me, stops. Halt, new cadet. And we quickly found out that new cadet was a rank. It ranked well below a cadet. <laughs> They even said we ranked below the Commandant's dog, which they went way too low. But we had a little bit of self-worth because they let us know we were ranked right above the naval goat. So <laughs> it was bad. And as she said, halt, I'm like, yes, ma'am. Am I, ma'am? No, Sergeant. Where are you going? Oh, I don't know. Your four responses are, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. No excuse, ma'am. And ma'am, I do not understand. Very good, complicated conversation we had at the Academy. And all of a sudden, I just began to cry, just <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm breaking. And as she, I'm sure, picking her jaw off the ground in shock, said, stop. You need to understand that the 47 short months that we have, you have here, and the insignificant amount of training, you know, the small insignificant amount of stress we're putting on your life is nothing compared to when you entered into the Army. And men and women's lives are put on the line. And you will be a leader, and you will be leading them. So if this is too much for you, this may, be, this may not be the place. So go back to your room and figure it out. And so I'm sure, like, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, Sergeant. <laughs> and I truly, I had to figure it out. So I went back to my room. They had taken everything from us, but they allowed us to have one thing. And I kept a little Bible. And I opened up the book of Philippians, where Paul writes to the church of Philippi, I've been starving, I've been well fed. I've had little sleep. I've been well, I, I've slept well. I've been hungry. I've been well fed. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I just looked at myself like, I'm well fed. I could use a little bit more sleep. I'm definitely not beat, at least physically, morally, yes. But I needed to figure it out. And I needed God by my side. But just as Christ surrounded himself with his disciples, I also need men and women to surround myself, to help me, to carry me through, teach me how to shine belt buckles, shine shoes, shine, you know, iron, to learn how to live life. But I knew it was a place that God had called me to, and I wasn't going to give up. I wasn't going to quit. And the, year, the months flew by, joining Officer Christian Fellowship, being able to teach uh, Sunday school my junior and senior year. It was awesome to see the development and the friendships that I, that I grew. And as those 47 months flew by, I was commissioned as an officer in the United States Army. I was able to m marry my beautiful high school sweetheart, Tiffany, who's here with us today. But I was given that 45-man platoon, as that woman told me years earlier. 
And now I was truly in charge. And as, as we, as I reached Fort Lewis, Washington, my first duty station, we were given orders to deploy to Mosul, Iraq. Me, not knowing where Mosul was, looked it up in, in online and found out that it was Nineveh. Being located on the Puget Sound, I knew the last thing I was going to tell God was, no, I'm not going to Nineveh. <laughs> Some of us knew how it ended the first time. <laughs> so being newly married, I had to say goodbye again to my wife, to the family, to the freedoms that we have here in America. But I knew it was a calling that, that I was called to. Being deployed to Mosul, we were helping rebuild the Iraqi government, Operation Iraqi Freedom 3, rebuilding the country, helping secure, helping redistribute gasoline, electricity, we built parks, schools. My platoon's job was to help secure the mayor's building, basically the city uh, center in Missoula. But every day we were attacked by bombs in the road, men and women who wore bombs, Kalashnikovs, AK-47s, RPGs. Six of my men were seriously injured and had to redeploy back to America to recover. My company commander, Captain Bill Jacobson, Jr., my boss, the man who woke me up in the, in the night, woke me up in the morning, person I was accounted to every day, was killed on December 21st of 2004, along with 21 other men and women, when a man walked into a cafeteria and blew himself up. And it's times like that you really question God. Why? Why are we here? And it was just the Bible that I had to open back up to, that yeah, we're in a fallen world, but we have to stand up and stand true to his word and know that we're following him. I was given a mission on April 6 of 2005 to find a suicide car bomb. In a city of two million people, it's, it's a difficult, it's a little bit more difficult than it, than, it, than it says. As I found a suspicious vehicle, having local intelligence on the ground, I knew the best thing to do was to surround him, just him being suspicious. The back end of the car was lower than the front. And given the rules of engagement, you can't just shoot someone because you're scared. So parking my striker vehicle, it's an amazing eight-wheel wheel vehicle, massive 50 caliber machine gun on top. I was standing metal all the way up to my chest. I felt very protective, bulletproof glasses, helmet on. Parked my striker vehicle 30 yards away from him. I was facing east on the same road that he was on. He was facing west. No median in between us. Literally near side by side. Parked two other striker vehicles about 75 yards in front of him so he wouldn't pull away. I yelled at him to get out of his vehicle, and he looked over his left shoulder at me, raised his hand off the steering wheel, and shook his head no. I responded in the same manner, as did he, and then he let his foot off the brake. That's when I raised my M4 rifle to my shoulder and fired two rounds in front of his vehicle. Then, boom, my world went black. I woke up about a week later in Walter Reed Army Medical Center, blind the rest of my life, never to see again. But unfortunately, my life also went spiritually black. I no longer believed in God. I no longer, I, for some reason, I couldn't imagine how something this tragic, this devastating could happen to someone like me. You see, in the Bible, Jesus gives an example to his disciples of a Pharisee who followed the rules, followed everything, and basically said, I've done everything. I've checked all the blocks. I deserve heaven. And then a tax collector, a man who, who may have lived in sin, said, I don't believe in God. I don't deserve heaven. And Christ asks, which do I have more sympathy upon? And you see, I was more of the Pharisee. I did this. I did this. I did this. I deserve so much more than what I have received. And bitterness, anger, Resentment and fear just drove me to depression. But the love of my wife, love of my family and friends, reading the Bible to me, the massages were amazing. <laughs> it's been a little while. <laughs> just drew me back to God. And I realized that I had to forgive. I had to forgive the man who blew himself up. I had to forgive myself for the decisions that I had made and the place that I had put myself in. But most of all, I had to ask God to forgive me. 
Because I, I knew, just as Paul had said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I wasn't going to make it on my own. I had to have him surround me and help me through. And that's where my recovery pushed off and began. Only spent a little under two months at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. I pushed out to Palo Alto to Blind Rehabilitation Center to learn to live as a blind man. Using a stick, using a computer. It was awesome to see the development. But every day I was trying to be more independent, trying to do things on my own, being a ranger, being a stud, at least in my own mind. <laughs> I, I wanted to do things on my own. I remember asking the VA, you know, where's the gym? I'm like, the gym, what do you want to do there? It's like, I want to get my swole on. What do you mean? <laughs> <clears throat> then I had to go down the definition of swole, so <laughs> I want to lift weights. Well, after them teaching me the route, for a week, they finally let me go on my own. About 4.45 in the afternoon, entered into the hot Palo Alto sun. On the sidewalks, they had little mats to help tell the blind people our sticks, like this is an intersection. I took a left. It, alleyway was ahead. We fear alleyways. It's the depths of the unknown. Crossed it successfully. Took the first right at the next intersection. Took the, next, took the, next, the first left. The gym was straight ahead. After about a half an hour of getting my swole on, unfortunately was not drinking water. I didn't really have a fear because I knew the blind center was only 30 seconds away. Entered back into the hot Palo Alto sun, took the first right, took the first left, here's the alleyway. Made it successfully and now, now all I was waiting on was a mat. Unfortunately, couldn't find the mat. Then I quickly realized, Scotty, you're lost. And much like you all, when you're lost, you backtrack. Let me tell you, when a blind guy backtracks, it's a blind guy backtracking. <laughs> I unfortunately stayed lost. And after now not sweating, crying out for anyone, of course it being 515, everyone had gone, disappeared. I threw my stick down in anger, crying out to God, why? Why me? Why this life? You see, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in you. And just because we've gone through something hard or difficult doesn't mean, hey, God's going to bless you and every, every day is going to be smooth. It's still a relationship. It's still struggles and, and trials and tribulations that we go through that we have to trust in him and we have to believe in him and we have to trust in others. And I really don't think why should have ever been a question I should have asked. I think there's a note for all of us. It should instead have been, what, Lord? What do I do now? And how am I going to do it? Because as the, as, the, as the months passed by, me, on that day, all I had to do was walk in the parking lot and someone quickly asked, are you lost? And, yes. <laughs> as the months passed by, I was given an opportunity to continue to serve on active duty. And through prayer and, and just asking God and my wife and, and friends and family, I realized that I can still give back that I can still selflessly serve, though I may not know what I'm going to do, I knew I could make a positive difference, and God could use me in an amazing way. And that's what he did, and that's what he's still doing today. Being able to teach at the military academy, get a company command, and my last duty station at Gonzaga University, ROTC, it was awesome to see how God used me and impacted others, but it's because I stood behind my Christian faith and my beliefs. And though I had gone through a tough, tough time and faltered in my faith, it was God who stood by my side. And it was him calling me back to him and me understanding and hearing that call. So I go back to the beginning where I started the story. You see, I'm blind in this Iron Man. It was my brother-in-law who helped wake me up at 245, still something I don't do regularly, <laughs> helped me load the bicycle in his truck. He drove us to Coeur d'Alene. He checked us in. He made sure I got all the riding on my arms and legs. He was my partner. As we entered the water after the national anthem, he would tap my calf on the left. I'd move a little left. Tap me on my right, move a little right. He swam probably three miles to my <laughs> 2.4. And not to say I wasn't pushing myself, but I was singing, Jesus loves me. I was singing songs. I wasn't having a good time. 
but I was, I was, I was pushing it. On the tandem bike that I had, I was sitting in the back, pedaling my life away. Meanwhile, my partner, he's steering, braking, shifting gears, pedaling also, making sure we had water, making sure we had hydrate, you know, fluids, food. And then on the run, he's now guiding me. And it's me who's falling apart. It's me who's failing. But it was my brother-in-law who laid hands on me and just prayed that God give me the strength, that I see the finish line. Because as Paul writes, it's a long race, and we should never give up. We have to keep fighting, and God will carry us through. And after 13.1 miles, halfway done with the marathon, the time, which Ironmen are really cool with, really good and really bad, is if you don't make the time, they just tell you, sorry, you got to get off the course. They knew, timeline-wise, at the rate that we were going, we'd never make it. My wife, bless her heart, seeing a pale face, someone who wasn't eating, wasn't drinking water, me, she knew something was wrong. And she knew where my mind was. And she yelled at me, Scotty, you have to understand that you're not doing this for yourself. You're doing it for the men and women who never made it back. But just as importantly, you're making it and you're doing it for the men and women who did make it back but are still fighting. So keep pushing on. You can do it. And darn it, when your wife is right, <laughs> the time that we cut off that second half marathon was literally an hour faster than the first. I literally felt like on top of the world, running down Sherman Avenue as a crowd was cheering and they said, Scotty Smiley, you are an Iron Man. But in closing, it is the long race that we all are here to run. And it's the trials and tribulations that we go through we can't get stuck in. We have to understand that, we're, that God is by our side. And though it seems difficult, though it seems trying, it's during those times we have to know who's actually carrying us, that we're walking in God's footsteps. And many times, God is actually carrying you. So as you continue the day and you push through life and, and recognize the leaders of, of Orange County, this state and this country, especially after this election, keep each other in prayer. Congregate as fellow believers and hold each other up. And I know if we do it, we'll continue to be the best country in the world. And I know we will all be able to do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Major Smiley, for, for coming here, giving us that word of encouragement, and pointing us back to Christ. Thank you so much. Please remember that Scotty's going to be in the back here signing books and immediately following the breakfast. And to that end, when, uh, later when we sing, uh, Tiffany and Scotty are going to make their way. They're not leaving. They're making their way out to the, to the book room in the back. So that, that's just a reminder to make sure we get back there. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. We now have a response from our host and county executive, Steve Newhouse. Steve's been an Orange County executive since 2014 and also serves our country in the Navy Reserves. He and his wife, Rachel, are parents of three, soon to be. <laughs> the, uh, these are young Jedi children uh, under the age of six, right? Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All under the age of six. Uh, Steve has become an inspiring friend of mine. Uh, please welcome our county executive, Steve Newhouse. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Um, I want to thank the committee uh, for putting this together. And, and, and Scotty and, uh, was saying that it's only been two years. I said the same thing. And I get embarrassed when I hear Putnam County and Dutchess have been doing it so long. But I only got here three years ago, so I'm on, I'm on track. And... Uh, 
I also got to thank Dot and, and Mary Pat uh, putting me behind Scotty Smiley. So I, I don't know if I drop the mic and just go down and sit down. And, and uh, But, uh, you know, I, I have three quick things I want to mention. Uh, f first of all, uh, earlier this summer, well, actually, when I got elected to town supervisor about, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago was my start in like being a manager in, on a political level. Uh, the first invitation, and if anybody knows me, if you invite me and I'm available, I go. I'm one of those guys that just goes to these things. I, I'm one of those, in life, it's half of us being there. You got to be part of it. So the only person that invited me to anything when I became town supervisor was a rabbi. He goes, I'm doing a Hanukkah thing. And I was like, I don't know anything about Hanukkah. I hear the songs. The, you hear uh, Adam Sandler and his song every year to try to, <laughs> to, to, try to compliment all, all the array of Christmas songs out there. So I go to this thing. I became friends with this uh, local rabbi. So earlier this year, uh, Mary Pat from my office says, you know, I got an invitation for this rabbi. It's just from his wife, though. And it's his 40th birthday. So I go to his birthday. And his rabbi is the guy speaking with me and to, the, to this close audience of friends. And the rabbi said birthdays are about two things. You know, people look at them in two different ways. They either celebrate them and are happy, or they are depressed or angry or looking at them in, in fear as they come along. And he said that's for, in, in his opinion, for two reasons. Do you feel that you've accomplished everything in life? Not that you got your degrees or you've done this or you're making this much money, but have you given back enough? Has your life really been in vain? Have you served the Lord or have you served yourself? And I was like, man, that nails it. On my birthday's next week. I'm, I, I don't, I'm looking forward to it. I love it. I'm excited. I think I love every part of life. And uh, I've been blessed, really. I got a wonderful wife and family and you know, my, my staff who's here and my friends, Tim Mendel, who was voted off the island, but you're still my, I still love you. He was, he's a good close friend of mine uh, from the Brudelhoff community. Um, we cherish our wives and our, and our children. And it, it is the center of our universes. And Annie Rabbit, the county clerk, and the district attorney who are not coworkers of mine, we're friends. We really are not coworkers. And all we do is talk about how we can change and, and help people and, and our families. Once every month, I drive down to Virginia for the military. I got assigned a year ago to the Atlantic Fleet, to the commander of the Atlantic Fleet as one of his uh, staff officers. And uh, on Sunday, we have a lot of clergy in my, department, in my department now. For some reason, I've never been a unit that has chaplains from, and, they're, and they're Jewish, they're, they're imams, they're, um, they're, they're all different denominations of Christianity. So last week, you know, they're like, you know, when you get a break, you go to the chapel on a military base. They have a chapel that's for everybody. Everybody uses it. It's just a place when you get time, you go. And last week I went, it's a pretty funny thing because it's like going to a Chuck E. Cheese birthday party. They try to shuffle different denominations out there and the Catholics get out and the Lutherans and they're like, you Catholics take so long. Come on, we only got an hour to do this. And then every denomination goes through it. So in the, in, when you go back into our quarters, right across from the chapel is my headquarters for, for the commander. And uh, when you go in there, it's got all the ships that are in our fleet, the destroyers, the cruisers, the flat tops. But there's also a big uh, placard up there, and it says, don't make me come down there, and it's signed God. <laughs> and uh, and, and, and I, I will tell you, as much as people criticize how things are changing in the military, God is very, very much a big part of the military. There is no shame. I don't care what branch I see my, my Stuart Air Guard uh, men and women over there who uh, just do wonderful stuff. There is no shame in being a believer in the military. No shame. And they have not tried to take that away from us. And, and, and that phrase, that phrase, don't make me come there, and it's kind of uh, reflective of what I said last year. I'm not one of those guys that pray. I'm a very, uh, very closed-in religious guy. I'm not one of those. Uh, I haven't gotten into the gospel, dancing around and doing that stuff, but my wife, my wife does. Um, and I'm kind of like the laid back. I do it my own way. I'll talk to you about it, but I'm not really as crazy as it. But I don't drive, and I'm running, running late for work and pray to God. Please, God, let me get, let me get on time, or let, let me get to this meeting. I'm one of those guys like, this guy's got a big list of stuff to do up there. And if I'm praying, it better be good. And, uh, and, that's, and that's what I, I honestly do. So when I, when I pray, I don't pray for myself to have a prayer breakfast every year, because that's, that's not ending. I pray for the, the tiny, tiny group of people that don't believe in a prayer breakfast, that they have that spirituality someday that fills that hole that they have. But I, you know who I do pray for? 
I pray for the men's, and men and women in the military, and not just like the generic thing. Their mission is very diverse right now. It's not about just combat. It goes from combat to humanitarian and back and forth. One thing that the, uh, my senior staff and the district attorney and I have is we have, I, I, I always lift up my iPhone to show you this. Uh, we run emergency management for the county all day long, day after day, night after night. We get an emergency thing, uh, cops responding to active shooter situation, uh, cops responding to overdose of heroin, you know, uh, law enforcement, emergency responders responding to these horrific things. That's who I pray for. Because those are the things that I can't control. That's who I pray for. And um, I also pray uh, for, yeah, I do one selfish thing. I do, I do pray for my immediate family. I don't pray for myself. I pray more for, God, please look after my, ki my, my kids and my wife. Because one thing, being a, being a believer, is that we're here to serve the Lord. To serve him, not to give him gifts, but to do good things. And a lot of things I see out in our community, in our society, and every prayer kind of alluded to it with, with the presidential election and with society going on here. We had a horrific uh, shooting uh, two weeks ago from a young kid that killed two young girls with their whole lives, innocent bystanders, whole lives in front of them, is this lack of a moral compass that we have out there. I was, I'm, I'm, not like, I'm not the model Christian, but my parents instilled in me respect, values, caring for other people. And that's what matters to me. And I think what we can all do, leaders, we're all leaders in this room, is to spread that word. Get people to, you don't have to push them into it because some people take a little bit of time, but help them get to that place where they have that spirituality. And I've seen good things happen from that. You know, uh, I saw Chris Molinelli was here earlier and uh, we've, we've gotten homeless people off the street together with Darcy Miller. We've helped addicts. Uh, I was telling Pastor Jared a, a couple years ago, we did an intervention in my office of a young woman that was my wife's age. I was in their wedding party. She became an alcoholic, five times in and out of rehab. Those people need our prayer. Those are the people that we can change. So uh, we got to continue. We have a long list of jobs in front of us and, and challenges. But I have total faith. Scotty Smiley, I mean, unbelievable. Tiffany, I mean, you guys are the epitome of a marriage. You know, sticking, but that's what it's all about. I got 10 years on going on. My wife, we've been through a lot, but we are blessed. But you've done more blind than most people will ever do who have vision. That's, you know. I, I can't even begin to venture doing the Iron Man. And I told you, we, we, we laughed and talked a little bit outside there. Being a father is like the best gift in the world. And it changes you. Being a parent is like the, I think, the maximum. Right, Larry? Absolutely. And uh, I told Scotty, I said, you know, all the stuff you've done, the Iron Man's, the climbing Mount R R Rainier, being able to change your diaper and being completely blind. <laughs> I'm the worst diaper changer, and I do it every day. My wife makes me do it first thing in the morning. Wake up, your son's here. Come on, dad, in a year ago. Because I, I made it, there was a mistake about a year ago. They had Parenthood Magazine put me on the cover of it, right? And they said, bring your family, we're gonna do a photo shoot. So we did a photo shoot at my office. And they said to my wife, like, no, no, we don't need you in this. So my wife, I was like, I don't know. So my wife was not in this. So I get in this thing, front page edition. It's me and my, ki my kids and I, and my wife's not in it. And uh, so now that is a crutch that I have to bear every day. My, so uh, it is uh, truly an honor to serve everyone in this room and to serve with you, my fellow leaders. Uh, I think the, the, our future is bright. I have not lost confidence. You, talk, you, you listen to a person like, like Scotty or his wife Tiffany about the faith they have to get them through the hard times. There was a young blonde haired lady that came up. Where are you? Um, I know you're out there, Mrs. Allen. Barbara, where are you? Did you leave already? Stand up. Barbara Allen lost her husband in 2005 in Iraq. He was killed. And people like that, and Scotty, they could, they could wallow, they, they, get a, they get a pass, right? They, we, we can never see them again. They can go and be a turtle and go up in their shell. They've suffered enough. But time and time again, I'm inspired by those type of people out there who say, you know what, I'm not gonna give up. And her, her job, we hired her in the county, her job every day is to help 
veterans, men and women that are suffering, victims, whether they're alive or, they, or somebody had passed away or their children, Scotty inspiring people, Tiffany inspiring people. So they're here. There's people that walk around us that are examples. Those are the, those are the folks that we need our kids, our younger generations to have as role models. So uh, continue to serve. I'm really blessed to be your county exec. I'm gonna continue to do everything I can for you. And thank you for being here today. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Steve, once again. Thank you, thank you for having the courage to continue with these prayer breakfasts at the county level and heeding the good book when it calls us to never cease praying. Say it, never cease praying, never. Our closing prayer today will be given by Eric Savakul. Eric Savakul has been a lifelong resident of Orange County and has built a reputation for excellence in the commercial construction industry for over 30 years partnering with businesses to build better communities. Eric's a principal at CCI Construction and is an elder at Grace Community Church. I consider him to be a very special brother in Christ. He and his wife Karen have two children, one grandchild, share a passion for ministering to children and families throughout Orange County. Eric. Thank you. Let us pray. Father, we humble ourselves today, Lord, and we thank you for the hearts of the people in this room to come and stand in the gap for you, praying for our communities and our leaders, Lord. The world and all who live in it belong to you, and our hope and faith is in you and you alone. We pray for you to move mightily in the hearts of our people across our nation to make a, make a difference in the world. May all who encounter us see our love uh, your love in us and through us, and may the hope we have in you radiates and allows us to be your hands and feet, showing your love for all who are brokenhearted. Mm. Fill us with the power to walk, walk according to your truth and allowing us to be the leaders you have called us to be, even when it's not popular. We pray for the families in our communities that are hurting and feeling that there's no hope. May you hold them in the palm of your hand and let them feel your love and hope. We pray for the wisdom for our community leaders, for your grace and mercy to be upon them, and in all that they do, they be grounded in your thoughts and not theirs. God, we cry out to you that all we say and do will bring glory to your name, that people that we see would see a difference in us and would seek you through our witness. As we leave this place today, we pray that this will not be the end of a prayer breakfast, but will be the start of a year-long season of prayer that will transform our lives and everyone we influence. And until we meet again, may we be one in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank, you. Thank you so much. We thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to take a moment to complete the cards that are on the table. Uh, remember that Scotty's going to be signing books in the back. Uh, Hope Unseen is the name of his book. We look forward to seeing you again at the monthly prayer breakfast. And uh, next year for the third annual Orange County Prayer Breakfast. One last word, one last word. Oh, Orange County and beyond, hope in the Lord from this time forth forevermore. God bless you all. Well, we just finished our second prayer breakfast in Orange County. It was a wonderful event. A lot of people from all different faiths came together to really pray for our leaders in Orange County, in New York State, and throughout the nation. Uh, it's a wonderful experience to bring people together and really uh, pray and use that power of prayer to make some positive changes in our society.